Welcome to our second day of um, introduction um, with R, introduction to R. Um, I'd like you to pull the latest version of the project so that you have all the updates. Um, you might need to be connected to the internet. Okay, and um, in your files, you will find a file called codesnips.r. And this is where I will place any significant piece of code that is not in your my whatever file, um, but that's something that we develop on the side. So what I've put in there is a function to make dinucleotides, the code that we wrote. But I've also put in a few notes that we didn't do yesterday, improving the function. I said, you know, we're doing it the most simple and most pedestrian way possible. We're just iterating over every position and we're capturing the two nucleotides that we need to have and then we're pasting them together and putting that into a vector. The paste function itself um, gives us a smarter way to do this because vectors that are pasted are joined element by element. So if I have two vectors and I paste them, we just paste each element in pairs together. So the way this works is assume we have two ve vectors, A, B, C, and D, E, F. And uh, if we paste that together with a colon character, with the colon character to separate them, what we get is the first element of the first vector and the first element of the second vector. And the first element of the second vector, uh, the second element of the first vector and the second element of the second vector and the third element of both vectors and so on, right? Or if we have three vectors, one goes from one to three, one from four to six, one from seven to nine, we have one, four, seven, two, five, eight, and three, six, nine. So we can use that to do dinucleotides in one simple expression. As, as another example, um, I've uh, shown an example how to use this to paste together all the 64 codons. That's something that comes up from time to time. I, I need the codons, so I need to do that. So what I do here is I build a vector with 16 repetitions of A, 16 repetitions of C, G, and T. Then I make a second vector, four repetitions of A, of C, of G, of T, but the whole thing repeated four times. And then I make a third vector, just A, C, G, and T, but repeated 16 times. So the first vector looks like this, 16 A's, C's, G's, and T's. Second vector looks like this, a, C, G, T, four times, repeated four times over. And third vector is just A, C, G, T, A, C, G, T, all the time. Now, if I take these three vectors, take them as, you know, as, as columns and paste them together, I get, voila, the 64 codons. Right? So the first letter in the first codon is the first character from here, the first character from here, the first character from here. The second codon is this A, this A, and this G. Third codon, A, 
A G, A A T, A C A, and so on. So you can permute letters in this way and paste them together in this this approach to, to building permuted uh, the version of strings is useful in many ways. But now this means we can write a super simple expression for our dinucleotides. So I've changed the function dinucleotide vector to just, remember it was this longish for loop where we calculate froms and twos and then paste things together. So I just make an index from one to the length of my input vector minus one. So everything but the last nucleotide. And then I paste together the values from one to minus one and from two to the end, idx plus one, with separation. And Oh, the, the, the parameter separation um, introduces a character that separates each of the values that are being pasted together. So in this case here, um, where were we? Where we pasted our A, Bs, and Cs, we use the separator of a colon. Right? So the output string is then A colon D, B colon E, C colon F. But if there's no separator, it just means put them letter against letter, character against character. By default, paste uses a single blank as a separator. So we need to, to basically uh, specify no separators. And... Um, yeah, I've overwritten my seek with something else that's actually uh, not nucleotides, but amino acids, but it's the same thing. Uh, it's a sequence. The last letter in each element has to be the same as the first of each other element because we're, we're building overlapping dinucleotides. And the rest in these code snips is just the things we've we've written out for our bar plots. So we'll do something else today. Um, oops. If you've downloaded um, the newest version of your code and if, you've, if you type in it, it reinitializes and, and creates copies of things that might not be there. Um, yeah. One of the files here is my data integration, and we'll talk about data integration today. So open that file use it to edit it. I'm going to edit um, code snips if necessary and journals, my notes if necessary. Mostly this year. Um, <coughs> now, as you know, Our data is very high dimensional. That didn't used to be the case. You know, 15 years ago, you, if you were working in genomics, you were working with nucleotide sequences only and sometimes translating them to amino acid sequences. If you were working in protein structures, you were working with structured data only. If you were working in, in genetics, you were per perhaps working with pedigree data only. But nowadays, things are are immensely more complicated. For every single gene, we have tons of annotations. We have sequences and transcripts and exons and hundreds of variants and SNPs and structural variants. We have phenotype annotations. 
we have protein structures, we have long lists of uh, homologous sequences, of conservation, of experimental results, and so on, and so on, and so on. And to make the most of our data, of course, we need to integrate all of that. And we need to make informed decisions based on data that we get from a multiplicity of sources and with a multiplicity of meanings. This can be numerical data, this can be informal annotations, um, this can be uh, textual data, many, many different things. So what we'll do today is we'll, we'll integrate um, data onto a gene which is in the region which we looked at yesterday. And the goal is to get a plot that looks like this. <coughs> a plot that exactly does what we have here, uh, to, to my knowledge, doesn't exactly exist like that in R. So we will write ourselves code to make a customized plot. We're not just taking you know, everything from packages, we're, we're actually writing the code to do our work, i.e. we need to understand what we're going to be doing here. So what we're doing here is we're plotting um, cancer-related mutations, which we get from um, a cancer database, the Intigen database, onto a gene that we find in chromosome 20, GNAS, and we're going to sort them out by the different types of mutations, and we're going to plot um, them on the position where they appear in the coding sequence, in the protein sequence, and we're going to scale the circles that we draw as an annotation here by the frequency with which that mutation has been observed in the database. So, <coughs> the task is first to understand where is our gene, where is it located in, in the nucleotides that we have here, um, what's the gene model, what's being transcribed, what kind of mutation information do we have, where is that annotated to, and then integrate the annotation of the mutation locations with the gene model that we find in the genome database. So our first task is just to open the Ensemble Genome Browser again. If you've taken notes, you have a bookmark to that or the link that you used last time. If not, it's easy to find. And to open the coordinates 58,815,001 plus 100,000 nucleotides on chromosome 20 in the HG38, the most recent assembly in the Ensemble Genome Browser. And then let's see what gene is annotated to this region or what, what we know about this region in the first place. What is this region? When you're done, put up a blue post-it. If you're stuck, if you don't know what you're doing, if you have a hard time following me, put up a red post-it and we'll get you back on track.
text or is it fast to call? Save what? Are we saving the thing they're doing as a text file or as a fast to call? We're not saving anything yet. Okay. We're just we're just looking at the region. You you already you already saved these nucleotides yesterday. Now we'll, we'll discuss this page a little bit, but if you're already done, and, and I want to wait for uh, everybody to catch up. If you're already done, uh, you can look at the next task, and that's the question, um, where do you even find transcript coordinates? How do you go about, this is a genome browser page here. Um, where do we find the actual coordinates of the transcripts that are on annotated? in this window here. You didn't specify human, this is why you have many search results, but it got confused about something yeah. else. This is <coughs> So this is, this is um, where I'm reminded of what I said this morning. I'm, I'm a person who 
doesn't always read the instructions, but they're useful. You have examples here. There's a pattern of how things need to be set up. This is rat five colon and then a large set of numbers and a single hyphen and so on. So if we take this pattern and translate it into saying something like human 20, 58 million to 58 million 900,000, it'll just work. Okay, it seems, I see one red post-it, but that's probably a remnant. Everybody else is there. So, it um, seems we're all there. <clears throat> Most of the genes that are annotated here um, are GNAS something. Why, is there, why are there so many different versions of that? What does that even mean? So, for example, you have this red one here and this red one here and, and uh, this one here. Are these all genes? Why are they different? What, what's the difference? Alternative splicing. Alternative splicing, yes. The bane of working with sequences. This is horrible. You're looking at a sequence and you think, well, that's the sequence that you have. Well, no, that's possibly one of the sequences. There are many sequences that are produced from a single gene, usually. And they are spliced together in different ways by alternative splicing. GNS seems to be one, I, I just randomly picked that, so this is just my luck. It's one of the most complicated uh, loci in the human genome. It's multiply imprinted, uh, by allelic key transcribed. It depends on what you inherit from your mother and your father. And it's alternative spliced. And, it's all over the place. So let's, let's look a little more about what we're doing here. The idea is once we've mastered that, everything else will seem easy by comparison. But the difficulty here, mind you, is not R. Uh, the difficulty is the molecular biology. Molecular biology is insanely messy. And we just have to be aware of that. We can, we can put things into our neat computational paradigms but if we don't take into account the messy biology, we'll be just doing cargo cult bioinformatics. Okay, so how do we get more details on anything here? It's a web page, right? So what do we usually do with web pages? We click on things. So what happens if you click on one of these things, like this here? Ooh, we get a nice pop-up. So. This tells us it's a gene. Uh, it's called the GNAS complex locus. It has a gene ID. We can also click on that. It tells us the location of the locus. It tells us that we've clicked on exon one of four of one particular transcript. There is a large number of transcripts, um, and they have different exons. So we can, we can find transcripts. There's a protein um, which is annotated to that with protein var variations and so on. So the <coughs> the first thing we want to do is we want a better idea of um, the transcripts. So for that, We'll just open the gene page where we will find more information on the gene itself. So um, I, I usually have about 250 tabs open on my browser because 
uh, I have a habit of just opening new information in, in new tabs. Um, I don't know. You, you can use the back function or you can use it in a new tab. You're probably better off you, uh, doing this in a new tab. So either um, command click or just open link in new tab. And that's the gene information page. It tells us something about uh, the complex locus. Um, it has synonyms and so on. It tells us there are 58 transcripts, uh, 76 orthologues that are known, one paralogue in a member of protein families. It's associated with 115 different phenotypes. So it's an important gene, that, that mutations of which have a, a large number of consequences. <laughs> And there are proteins that correspond to one, two, three, four uniprot KB identifiers. So let's, let's open one of these, P63092, to see a little more about what uniprot tells us about the protein that is um, <coughs> that is encoded here. So GNAS is a guanine nucleotide binding protein, alpha isoform short. And this 63092 is uh, version two of this. Um, <coughs> these G proteins function as transducers and numerous, si numerous signaling pathways. So no wonder there are a large number of phenotypes associated with it because it's a central part of the machinery in the cell that transduces signals from the outside to the inside and changes gene expression patterns. But going back to the gene, um, we said we wanted to um, have a better idea of the transcripts. So we click on show transcript table. And this tells us the transcripts that are there. Some have proteins. Um, of no proteins, some have proteins of different lengths, uh, some are associated with one or more <coughs> um, uh, splice variants. So for example, notice we've looked at uh, P63092, but we already see three different versions of that in the transcript table. One that encodes only 380 amino acids, one that encodes 394 amino acids, one encodes 395 amino acids. So in order to be able to take that transcript information and actually pull out the actual nucleotides from our nucleotide table, we need to um, download the transcript coordinates. And that's very simply done. We, we have the transcript table open. Uh, we click on export data. What we want to output is um, <laughs> comma-separated values, because we want the actual data, not, not the nucleotides themselves. Uh, the strand is the feature strand, usually the plus strand in, in the genome. No flanking sequence. And as options for the comma separ separated values, we only want the gene information. If you select all and you get all variation features, um, you will get every single SNP that has been ever annotated to one of these transcripts. And trust me, that's a very large file. You don't want to do this on your mobile or if you're anywhere on limited bandwidth. But we just want the gene information, something very simple. So comma-separated values, feature strand, no flanking sequence, and as options for the comma-separated values, only check the box for gene information. And let's look at this as text. Right. So this is <coughs> kind of large. 
not too large. It's kind of hard to read, so we'll download the file, we'll save it, um, we'll read it into R, and then we'll try to find information of interest to us. So save the results page under the following file name. ENS, ENSG, blah, 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 whatever, data.csv. This is the ENSG, Ensemble Gene. So these, these identifiers uh, have different semantics. ENSG is an ensemble gene. ENSP is an ensemble protein identifier. ENST is an ensemble transcript. ENSE is an ensemble exon. And they have very long numbers. And the long numbers are important for the database because these are stable identifiers. So this means um, if there are new versions of, of transcripts or, or exons or whatever, they get new identifiers. They're being updated. And uh, so save that to your project directory. Save as text. Um, don't append any uh, text or whatever uh, to that. If your browser automatically tells you, no, 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 this is a text file, it has to have the extension .txt, then roll with it, call it .txt, but remove that identifier later. Once it arrives in your project folder, in your file, it is supposed to be called ENSG, well, zero zero eight seven four six zero data dot csv and the next task then is to read this file into an R data frame which is called GNAS transcripts so now we, we read a file so the last file we read in R uh, we used read lines this was unstructured data. We just wanted the text and then we pasted it together. This was nucleotide data. Now this is structured data. It's comma separated values. So if you think of this as, as like a spreadsheet, um, the data in each row is separated by commas that correspond to each cell. So if there's five values in the spreadsheet, you need five commas, uh, four commas separating five elements. If some of these elements are missing, you might just have series of commas there. So these are empty elements. And you'll also notice that this file has a header, i.e. it has a list of names that correspond to column names once we read this in. So once again, it has a header that corresponds to column names. It's <coughs> organized in rows. Each row has the same number of elements. All the elements are separated by, um, by commas. Now one thing we could do, for example, following on what we did last time, is we can, we could um, just read lists with read lines as text, go through every single line, split the line apart using string split on commas. Then we would have all the elements, and then we could use these elements and paste them together into a table. But since this is a super frequently encountered format, um, there are specialized functions that read files of this type. So most often you will encounter something that is either a CSV file or a TSV file, comma separated values or tab separated values. This is the most frequent vanilla structured data interchange format, CSV or TSV. Mind you, 
at home in your lab, you will often find yourself having uh, data in Excel spreadsheets. Now, when you want to read Excel spreadsheets into R, there are specialized functions to do that. I try to avoid that, if at all possible. They often make assumptions about how Excel format works, and it's, not, it's poorly documented, and, and this can go wrong in many ways. What's much better is to ex export a CSV from Excel itself, and then read the CSV. As you export the, the CSV from Excel itself, you can have a good look at your data and see, well, does this even make sense? So for example, um, you know, what we often have in, 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 in Excel um, worksheets is that we have a section of data of one sort and then somebody puts different data of another sort on the same, uh, on the same worksheet. Now if you read that as a CSV, you know, in one column we might have uh, proband identifiers and in the same column but uh, uh, further down below we might have, um, um, uh, well, I don't know, hemoglobin concentrations. So that's not good. So, so basically take one set of data that belong together and export that as a C CSV format, save the CSV format and then read it into R. Well, but then how? How do, we, how, do we, how do we read this into R? Into a file called GNS transcripts. What do we need to do? I don't know. You tell me. If you don't know, Google. What would you Google for? So if I need to, to Google for something like that, I, what, what I do is say R. I always started with R. Um, I don't know if this just works very well or if my personal whatever machine learning algorithm is behind that uh, somewhere in the big Google Cloud has learned that I need results relating to the programming language R if I do that. But it seems to work very well. So I start with R. Um, Incidentally, this one wouldn't know about my search preferences because um, I'm not signed into Google on this browser here. Okay, R, um, read CSV into object, something like that. First thing that comes to mind. Ooh, read CSV in R. Take the top hit. And apparently there's a function, read.csv, with a file argument, and a header argument, and separator arguments, and so on. So that looks useful. <coughs> so we have genus transcripts is read. CSV. Oh, there's a CSV2. CSV, CSV2. Which one do I use? What's the difference? Can you spot the difference? Right. The separator is different. There's a second difference. The second difference is the parameter DEC, DEC. What's the difference here? One has a comma, one has a period. Why would they do that? Some people use decim decimals with comma, I think, right? Some people use decimals with commas. Who? Europeans, Europeans do that. <laughs> so if you're in Europe, they rarely use thousand separators, but if they do, they use periods for that. And they use a decimal comma, not a decimal period. So be aware of that. If you get data from your collaborators from, I don't know, Roche or Sanofi in, in, in Switzerland, your data might have periods and not, not commas. Uh, it might have commas in the numbers and, and not periods. Now what happens if you read that data with CSV? 
the read CSV thinks that's a field separator and it splits your values with the comma. So you have to be careful. Inspect your data and make sure that your field separators and your comma separators are the same thing. If somebody's written a comma separated value file but put in um, numbers that have decimal commas, not decimal periods, you're in trouble. This is really going to be um, probably, if it's a larger file, insalvageable. Yeah? Um, on, my, on the right, there are a couple of different read. Uh, there's an underscore CSV and a dot CSV. And one is called a reader, and one is says utils. What, okay. is the different, what, what is the <coughs> column on the right telling us? So this, this column here, the one in the, in the curly braces, tells us which package this comes from. <coughs> so I've got a couple of packages loaded. Up. I should briefly load this one not to confuse us. But read R. OK, read R. I don't know when you've loaded read R. I don't know if it's in my functions. But it's a really useful package. Um, did you use read R yesterday in your integrated assignment? No? So anyway, read R, R-E-A-D-R. Readar is part of, did you discuss tidyverse? Mm -hmm. Okay. No. But you did ggplot, right? Yeah, without the larger tidyverse. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about tidyverse. Now is a good, as good a time as it, the tidyverse. You might have noticed that some of R's functions are very much um, designed to work in the mindset of a statistician who would have been working in the 80s and 90s and, and early 2000s. So for example, whenever you read in a file, like with read CSV or read TSV, um, any text in that file is transformed into a factor. Any string in that file is transformed into a factor. So since we, 99% of all cases don't want that, we always have to write strings as factors equals false. Otherwise, this will mess up our data. Now, <clears throat> if you were doing statistics in that time, you would usually have um, uh, descriptive factors in, in, your, in, in your data sheets, things like male or female or you know, some, some label for the cohort of whatever you were looking at. So this made a lot of sense to immediately transform strings into factors. We don't have that. We don't use strings as factors a lot. Us usually what our strings are are simply accession numbers, and it makes no sense whatsoever to turn them into factors. You can't regress on accession numbers. That, that, that makes no sense. So we usually need to turn that off. That's one thing. Another thing is that some of these things are slow, they're, they're, not, um, they're not always um, very robust against errors and so on. So people started thinking about aren't there better ways to work with complex R objects uh, and make them more robust and, and work with them in different ways. And at the same time, one of the very prolific contributors to, to important advances in R, Hadley Wickham, who is now working with R Studio, who is basically, who's the author of uh, ggplot, right? Um, that uh, came up with different ways of using the programming language. Uh, you might have noticed that ggplot has a completely different mindset of how we go about uh, working with plots, basically building a, a data grammar. Um, uh, there were other innovations there, um, <coughs> different ways of, of merging of, uh, complex data frames and pasting them together, uh, things like um, not using intermediate assignment of variables, but just flowing data from one function to another function to another function with, um, with, with a pipe operator. And all of that is, has become quite popular in, in a way that 
in, in a sense, this all constitutes a kind of language split. And things that are associated with this new way of using R are often associated with the prefix tidy. So tidy something, um, uh, reading data, and so on. So um, it, we've, we often refer to that as the tidyverse of using R. Now, some people advocate of using these different data formats uh, immediately and, and teaching that way. Um, others advocate of just going the same way that we're doing here, using very simple procedural commands, and then later on learning more about what these, these other language alternatives and idioms are about and adopting them later. Um, <coughs> people who, who advocate doing the tidyverse things first, say, well, R is a functional language, and all these tidyverse functions have been designed to work very well with the functional language. So if you want to learn R, that's the right way to do it. Um, and they have a point. I say, on the other hand, R is just one of the many languages and paradigms we use. And we should, uh, we're probably better off uh, working in a way that is easily translated and easily understood with, for people who come from other languages. and that don't idio um, emphasize idiomatic use of the language very much to be flexible and future-proof and so on. And of course, that's also true. And of course, these two views are incompatible, so we have to make a choice. And, you know, uh, go between these two functions. So why am I saying all, all of this? Um, <clears throat> it has practical consequences. For example, read are, really, these are better reading functions. So the deficiencies of old R, read, uh, dot CSV, and so on are not apparent in the way we use them here. But once you get to very large data, read R functions are extremely much faster and more efficient. The <coughs> output of a read R function, however, is not a data frame. It's something that is called a tibble. It looks like a data frame. It behaves like a data frame most of the time, but not all of the time. And um, so this is why I'm always a little bit hesitant of, of introducing the read R functions. Um, we're not going to do this here. We're going to use base, keep on using pure basic R in this workshop for the, for the most part. But if you ever find yourself working with very large data and you need to be very efficient about it, um, by all means, do explore things that you can you know, find under the keyword tidyverse and especially do explore the read R package. It's, it's a very well written piece of software. So I don't know why read R is on your computer, but there we go. It gave me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the tidyverse. Anything to add to that? Do you use tidyverse code in, in your lab? No, only ggplot. Only ggplot, right. Yeah. OK. So, where were we? Um, we need read CSV, not read CSV2. We're in the North American format here. Um, we need to give it a file name. Um, header is true by default. <coughs> Separator is comma. This is also there by default. Um, the decimal points, I don't even know if there are any. Um, we fill empty spaces with NAs. We have no common characters to find on so on. So that should be OK. Let's, let's see what this does. Uh, we have 1,420 observations of 18 variables. And let's have a look at what they are. So he, with this icon, the little spreadsheet icon, we can look into our data frames. Sources ensemble. <coughs> this is a gene feature. Um, start and end coordinates of the feature are defined. Some of them might have scores not applicable here. <coughs> 
um, there's a gene ID, there's a transcript ID, there's an exon ID, there's a gene type. So we see uh, microRNAs, we see antisense RNA, and we see protein coding RNA. So not all transcripts produced from this locus are necessarily protein coding. Some of them, for example, are antisense, which are important for regulation. And we could have had variations and, and probes, but we didn't, so this is all just NA. Now, <clears throat> 1,420 observations. Many of these rows we don't need, so we're not looking at antisense, for example. Um, so let's remove all rows from this object that are not protein coding. How do we do that? Remove all objects that are not protein coding. All, all rows that are not protein coding. So step by step. What's the first thing we need to do? We need to subset, right. But how? Something, something, but how? What, what's, what's, what's the semantic we need to figure out here? The semantic. So we need to understand what's in that file and how we can use it to identify rows that are protein coding genes. Right? So the first question is, you know, where does it tell me whether something is a protein coding gene or not? The gene type. So we look into our data. Right. And there's a column called gene type. And apparently some of these has value. So what do we find in column gene type? So the first step is how a protein coding transcript is labeled. That's not even an R question. It's a question about the semantics of, of your data. You have to understand what your data means. So apparently it's, this is information we find in the column gene type and um, it's there. So what different <coughs> values, we're looking at the column Gene type? Is that how it's spelled? Yeah, with an underscore. Now, what values exist in this column? What are the different strings we have in that column? How can we find that? We could just print all 1,480 um, values, but we can use the table function. is to identify possible choices. Why do we need to do that? Well, we've scrolled through this a little bit. We saw that there's some rows that are labeled with protein coding. Um, there might be gene types that we didn't think of, but that actually also identify data that we're interested in. So in order to be sure we're doing the right thing here, we, we really need to look at everything that's contained, all the alternatives we have in, in that particular column. So somebody knows, no, uh, mentioned table. So let's, let's try, see what table does. 
table of what? Unique values. If I do, if I run the function table, what's the input table once? What type of input did we give table yesterday? data frame, a file name, a vector, a vector, a vector of something. So table will go through a vector of something and then tell us what is, what are the unique elements in the vector and how many of them are there. So table, so I need a vector. How, I, I have a data frame. How do I get a vector from a data frame? In particular, I need a column. Again, subsetting, right? We subset an entire column. <coughs> so let's subset our data frame. Gina's transcripts. By something. By what? What rows do we want? Rows. All of them. All of the rows. So we want all the rows, so we put nothing restricting in here. And what columns do we want? Gene type. So what's gene type? It's a column name, right? So we can, we can use that string. And we get a line transcript and antisense and antisense RNA. And I have no idea why these would be two different things. Antisense and antisense RNA. Why are they listed separate? Do you know? Another question. Oh, a question. Yes. Yeah, just, just let me go through that. And CCDS genes and link RNA and LNC RNA. I, I've stopped keeping track of the different RNA types. What's the difference between link and link? LNC is long non-coding. And link? Well, you know, I is for intergenic. Oh. Well. Uh, long intergenic non-coding? Yeah. But I don't think they're actually technically different classes. Right, so this would be one of the examples. You're interested in non-coding RNA, right? And you think you see link RNA, but there's also LNC RNA. And you would need to discover that to get all of the RNA, uh, non-coding RNA types that you need. MicroRNA and miscellaneous RNA and protein coding. So the, one, the, the rows that we're interested in are actually um, all the ones that are labeled protein coding. OK. Um, so that would work. Um, there's. Another way that we would commonly use here, and that's the function unique. So unique is related to table in the same way that it picks out unique occurrences, but it doesn't count them. We don't actually, well, we could be interested in the counts, but um, here something we need is, is actually uh, unique. Now, <coughs> this way of doing subsetting with square brackets um, is perfectly valid, and in some cases, you absolutely need to work this way. Commonly, I find myself um, using a somewhat different syntax, and that's the dollar operator. Dollar operators on data frames return columns. So using a dollar operator gives me the entire column. I think I've just gravitated using that because once I type in the dollar here, I get all of the columns in that data frame, and I don't need to remember what it's called, and I can just pick it out uh, gene type. So unique gene A dollar transcript, uh, gene A transcript dollar gene type 
um, gives me the same information that I was looking for in a different way. Almost. Do you notice something about that output? What, what about that line here? Nine levels, a line transcript antisense. What is that? Where did that come from? Is there something wrong with our column here? Let's 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 look at <coughs> what this column is with the useful structure command. This tells me this is a factor. Our gene type is a factor and not a character column. And it has nine levels. So there's nine different alternatives, but what it stores are the integers that correspond to these factors. So what read CSV did is it turned all the strings in our, in our data into factors. Didn't I mention we don't want that? I mentioned that we don't want that. So whenever you use any of the read functions, turn that off. Strings as factors equals false. So that's something that you really need to remember. This has, uh, this has to go into your muscle memory. Um, why do we need to type this all the time? Why can't we just set this as a global option? Well, the answer is you can't. <coughs> You can, but that will break everything, every package that you will load that makes an assumption that strings are being read as factors. So that, I think, setting global language options differently from what the default expectation is, is something that is error prone. I wouldn't do that. I just, you know, roll with it and every time I read .csv or read delimited, um, I I explicitly say strings as factors equals false. Okay, so we need to redo this command, gene as transcripts, and now we get the unique values, and now, as expected, um, the column is a column of characters, i.e. strings. So far, so good. Now, we said we want only rows that are protein coding. So how do we subset our table to the rows protein coding? Only these. So this is, this is a little Minus. filtering. Minus? Can we use minus? What, do, what does the minus what does the minus need to attach to? Yeah, but but, but you know you, you minus excludes things from the rows. You can do this in different ways. You can exclude the ones you don't want, or you can include the ones that you want. Minus is something that excludes, but what does the minus need? Minus some index, right? So if we want to do it with minus, then we need indices. So we need to find the indices that correspond to the values we want. It means you need to put like true and false, and it will be one and zero. 
Right. But if we no. use true and false, we don't we don't use minus, but we we might need to do something else with it. So <coughs> How do we get trues and falses in, in, in that situation? A vector is the operation of? Like a, like a true statement, like does this equal? Equal, exactly. So we test whether the contents of the column is equal to something. Can you write that? What does it need to be equal to? The string protein code. That's what we're looking for. So try writing that subsetting expression. As you, as you try that out, um, you're probably at some point going to just uh, print the whole table. Don't worry, that doesn't hurt the computer. It can do a lot of these. So just experiment and try to, to come up with a way to subset the table so that it only contains the rows of that have um, the string protein coding in the column uh, transcript dollar gene type. Once you've written the expression that subsets the table, please show us the blue post-it. If you think you're in trouble and it doesn't work, show us the red post-it.
Yeah, it's just because of the focus, the columns. But the focus, the columns. Right, so it shows you the first five columns, then it shows you the next five columns, and it shows you the five columns, and some of them are in these. So this is somewhere in the middle here. Oh, all right. Good job. So this is actually in order to use one. Okay. Um, so then we have the Thank you. 
If you are done with this, do put up your blue post -it. I'm not going to write out the solution, but maybe if, if you have troubles, let me remind you of what we want to do with subsetting how subsetting works in principle. I think in the pre-work tutorial I've, I've written that subsetting is needed every day and it's really important and this is really something you need to commit to your muscle memory. So let's, let's look again at what we're trying to do here. Um, we're subsetting a data frame. So that's our original data frame, and we only want a part of it. This means we subset by some condition. And in the data frame, we can address rows and we can address columns. So to subset something is we put one of the index, one of the selection mechanisms that we know of into the rows in a way where it will give us a subset of the frame. So for example, we can put in numbers, integers, and these are indexes. And we can use numbers as a negative to exclude some values. We can put in a vector of logical values that is as long as the number of rows, and this will return every value for which the vector is true and, and, and not return every row for which the vector is false. 
Or we can operate by row names or column names. So these are the three principal mechanisms. Index numbers, logical values, or row names. And here, because we want to filter by a condition, the most convenient way to do this is by a logical vector. So the, the challenge is to create a logical vector that says false for every entry in the column uh, gene type that is not protein coding. And it says true for every entry in the column gene type that is protein coding. So somehow in here, in the rows, we need to enter a vector that has that property, a vector which says true for every element of that column which is protein coding and false for every one that is not. So how do we get a vector of that type? Well, we take a vector of strings, of names, from that column itself, and we compare it using this, the comparison operator, the, the double equals sign, compare it with the string protein coding. And then we specify the second part here, um, <coughs> and that is all the columns that we need. Now at that point we could kick off all the columns that just have NAs, we don't need them anymore, but let's not even bother, let's just keep everything in by now. There's just one thing, in, in order to develop these things, an idiom I usually adopt is the following, I define myself a variable called cell, which then contains either the indexes or the logical vector or whatever, cell for selection. And I define my selection here. This makes it easier for me to, you know, get an idea of whether my selection command worked in the correct way. I can execute that command, then look at my selection vector and see how many true values do I even have in that? Um, how long is the vector? Is it as long as the number of rows that, so that it's correct? Um, you know, did this selection expression even work and does it give me the correct results? Which is often easier to tell from the vector itself than from applying it to the entire data frame and then snooping around in the data frame and trying to figure things out. So, select something that creates a logical vector that we want, and then we just use cell in here to subset by that vector. I could also, you know, take this long expression here and, 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 and put it in here, but then these nested expressions become very long and, and unreadable. I like to break these things up and breaking things up by defining a, a sp an explicit selection is something that's turned out to be very useful. So that said, um, maybe some of the people with the red post-its can figure it out. And if you can't, keep your red post-it up.
Okay, <clears throat> so for this something that creates a logical vector, here's, here's an example. If I have a vector that contains the letters A, B, A, D, E, and I compare that vector with the letter A, I get a logical vector which is true, false, true, false, and false. Right, so you need to take that principle and translate it to an operation that you perform <coughs> with gene A transcript scholar gene type as the vector where the information is that you're looking for. And the comparison is for a string, i.e. protein coding. Thank you. 
Except this one, it's, it's a factor for a different reason. Um, but it's referring to, they're both referring to the same factors. There we go. So it's like true, true, false, false. Right? Okay, so, so it's true for the first two, false for the second two. And now, if you want a subset, or we need a subset, so many of that, yeah, many of that only has one So we could do sub two on that row, so we can get A to C, or we can do a subset of many D F here and do it on the row, and then after that we get right. So just saying, we're just saying which row is true. So that's a part of it to be this automatically. Like it will only if the is true, say if it's true. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is it's that just that a square bracket indexing. Uh, so if so you have a vector, it's got one dimension. dimension. If you have a data frame, it's got two dimensions. Okay. I was wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like I don't have to tell it that. I don't have to say this is a part of the table. Yeah. And so you can do it using true false, or you can do it using the actual value of this. And then now we just create a new actual values. So we can say which. So what which does is it says for which indices D is true. Right? So now we're going to a vector that's one, two. And so now we're asking, is it rows one and two only on the same vector? So we get the same thing. So you can use trues and we can use a full vector to do those falses. Or you could just use a vector that's in the indices by number that you want. Well, yeah, a vector. It's a one dimensional, yeah, it's just a one dimensional concatenation of the same type of values. So a vector is always going to have the same data type within it, so they have all the elements, all the elements, and it's only one dimension. So they're all just concatenated. Oh, yeah, so you don't even need to do a lot of this. So here you put your uh, logic here. So it's just two different classes. So mm -hmm. for every row where this is true, it's true. And for every row where it doesn't equal protein coding, it's going to be false. Okay. So now here, you can just take this. And so now you know, for these guys, um, gene has transcripts. Mm -hmm. Two dimensions. It's got the rows that you can see by, or the columns. Okay. So rows, rows are before, okay. comma, columns are after. Okay. If you want all the columns, you just leave it blank. Okay. Um, and then, so then here, you want only certain columns. You only want, uh, sorry, you want only certain rows where this is true. So to do that, you can just put in the vector, which is this. Exactly, it's the one you just defined. So you just put in this, and then let me just make sure this one. Great, so you put in this vector. So you put in that vector, and now if you check this, you can do the table.
So none of them are equal to this, but they are equal to that. So now let's try it. Great. So it has to be an exact match. Blank code is followed by another code. This one is wrong. So that this one will work for you. Okay, to send you off into the coffee break, this is the canonical solution. I've, I've seen possible variants, but do try to get to that point. Um, if you, thank you. Um, if you still don't really understand how this works, uh, try to think of a few sample examples like examples that work in a similar way as the one that I've written up there and try to work with. This is, this is really one of the key steps of understanding how to work with data in R, how to subset things and how to filter it. We'll be doing that again and again and working with that again. So the canonical solution here is to pull out the column gene type from our gene as transcripts, which is a vector of strings, 
and we compare that with the equals operator to the, the string protein coding. And the result of that is a logical vector of the same length as this column here, which is true for every element that was protein coding and false for every other element. This new logical vector, this vector cell, has 1,420 uh, elements, so I can use it to subset my rows of the data frame. If I take GNA as transcripts and subset it such that I only use the rows for which cell is true, and all of the columns, my data frame, which was originally 1,420 rows, shrinks to 866 rows. And that's because Remember this little trick, we can sum over a logical vector and thus count the number of true values in the vector. If we sum over cell, we see there were 866 true values in that vector. And this corresponds to the fact that we now have 866 rows <coughs> left in the data frame after throwing out rows that we were not going to be using later on. Yeah. And then I indicate me the same as they count. Let me check that. Um, right. So <clears throat> revisit that. Think about it. This is one of the key steps. This is something that you actually really need to understand. Um, ask us during the coffee break. We'll, we'll be breaking for coffee now. We will be back continuing with this at 11.